Muscular dystrophy is a group of genetic diseases characterized by weakness and degeneration of the skeletal muscles that control movement. Today, we'll be discussing FSH muscular dystrophy, which has now been scientifically acknowledged as the most prevalent of all muscular dystrophies worldwide, affecting all ages, races, and geography. I'm Marlene Levitt. Our guest today is Amy Beckier, who has had muscular dystrophy for many years, and through her, we can begin to understand what this disease is all about. Welcome to PACE TV, Amy. Thank you, pleasure. It's a pleasure having you here. What exactly is FSH, muscular dystrophy? It is one of the most, as you mentioned, prevalent of all muscular dystrophies. There are nine major types. It stands for fasciocapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, which means it begins with the face, generates through the scapula and the upper arm, that's the scapulo, and humeral is the upper arm bone, the humerus. Uh, it's a misnomer because it does radiate in most cases down through the core and down into the legs as well. So what are the general symptoms? General symptoms, starting with the face, is difficulty closing the eyelids, in many cases dry eye, mm -hmm. uh, loss of uh, musculature of the face and the lips around the mouth. Some people have very big difficulty in speaking. I sometimes do when I'm tired. Uh, generates down through the scapula. There's a winging of the back, giving lack of support to the shoulder muscles, making it, in my opinion, the most difficult of all of the symptoms is the inability to raise the arms and do a lot of activities of daily living. I see. And on the face, do you have like uh, your eyes affected on that? Uh, eyesight, in some cases, they, they have found some irregularities, but nothing remarkable that's causing uh, great issues. In some cases, when it does affect children, uh, there is hearing issues, mm -hmm. but um, mostly in the mouth, the inability to whistle, mm -hmm. go, draw through a straw, and pronounce certain consonants. And what about your facial expressions? Facial expression, in many cases, can be masked, and it, uh, there are many, many uh, patients who have inability, complete inability to smile. Uh, this can be very devastating when someone looks at you and judges you within five seconds and sees his frowning face while the person might actually be happy and it does make for very difficult social issues. That's hard, really. And what about the pelvic muscles? You mentioned that. In some cases, uh, and in my case especially, the pelvic muscles and the core mm -hmm. muscles, the stomach, are affected, which makes for difficulty in walking, mm -hmm. uh, going upstairs. Um, and, and locomoting, and some parts of the lower leg as well, dropped foot, mm. uh, lifting the leg. Right. And what about the respiratory system? Is it affected? In, so, again, some cases, and I'd like to say right out at the beginning that all of these symptoms are so variable, from very, very mild to extremely severe with the same disease. I see. And we don't know where in the continuum we're going to begin or, or end up. So not everybody is going to have every one of these problems or symptoms. But yes, it can affect the respiratory breathing system muscles. Uh, I'm supposed to be on something called a BiPAP machine, which is similar to a CPAP snoring machine, except that it's bi-level pressure because we can't breathe out against constant pressure coming in. Mm. But it's supposed to assist in breathing and relax the muscles. And in all these symptoms, do you, does the patient feel pain? Not pain directly from the symptoms, but yes, there is a great deal of pain because other muscles are trying to do the job that they're not designed to do. Mm -hmm. The ligaments and the, the tendons are not getting the muscu muscular uh, support. The spine is not. So there are secondary issues and falling and injuries, and yeah, there are a great deal of pain. Yeah, so it varies from patient to patient. And time to time. Right. What tests are used to determine the actual diagnosis? FSH. Today, uh, mm -hmm. they do have DNA testing, which is much mm -hmm. more definitive. Uh, they know what they're looking for. When I was diagnosed in the 70s, they only had electromyograph where they stick a needle in your muscles and read the electrical signal, uh, muscle biopsies, mm -hmm. and of course, symptomatic. And being that it was inherited in my family, we had enough symptoms to be able to diagnose me. But today, it's much more definitive. And did they check your eyes or your or, or hearing? Anything like that? That's only as a secondary. secondary. That's not really a something that would give you the, mm -hmm. the descriptive symptoms. Right. And <clears throat> so now you've got a diagnosis, and what are the treatments after that? Well, we're hoping, <laughs> but nothing yet. Uh, just 
using all the facilities and orthotics and canes. I have a cane with me at mm -hmm. all times and, and uh, any kind of equipment that will help me. Uh, ibuprofen, mm -hmm. some physical therapy, light exercise, nothing that will overtax the muscle because they won't repair well. Water therapy, aqua therapy is highly advised. I see. And uh, the psychological effects, I assume, are many. And how did you handle that? As with all diseases, mm -hmm. uh, the psychological effects, but I will speak to FSH. Being a disease that progresses, it's a constant grief, a loss of, of body function. So once you get to a certain point and you acclimate and then you progress again, so you have this constant grieving process going on, which is very, very difficult to handle. It depends on your personality, of course, how well your coping mechanisms are, but it also depends on your family. It depends on your support system. Right. It can be very, very difficult from, uh, and ha depending on how mild or severe you are mm -hmm. and what stage you're in. It can lead f from very good coping skills to some people who have had thoughts of suicide. Oh my goodness. And how did you notice your first signs? My first signs were when I was 17 years old. Mm -hmm. I was fairly athletic and I did a great th three game bowling. Mm -hmm. Woke up the next day and my right shoulder was completely dislocated and out of my place. Goodness tremendous pain. Uh, it took about a year and a half before that subsided and it never really went back in place. And that was my first suspicion. And again, having it in my family and I saw the symptoms coming on, I knew. And you mentioned your family. How, how did that affect your family? Did, it, did you have that in your family? Yes. My father and through my father's lineage up through his mother, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was four out of six of, of my uh, great aunts and uncles, siblings had it. There's a 50% passing ratio in most cases. Mm -hmm. And then up as far as we can get up through my great grandparent. I see. But uh, my father was quite severe and passed away from secondary complications at age 54. Was he in a wheelchair? He was in a wheelchair. He was in a wheelchair in his late 40s. Oh my. So again, the severity is, is crazy because I am almost 60 and yet I'm still walking. I see. And how does it affect you today? Uh, physically, how it affects me is that I'm having the biggest problems, as I mentioned, with my upper body. Mm -hmm. uh, the walking and mobility, you can kind of compensate for. I have a scooter. Mm -hmm. I use the cane. I have a chairlift in my home. Really? I have a two-story house, and many people move when they are becoming debilitated, and I say I'm only on one floor at a time. Wow, that's good. Use that as a dumb waiter. And what about taking cupboards out and things like that? Very difficult. Very difficult to raise my hands, and I either have someone do it for me, but mm -hmm. in my bedroom, I have put in a pull-down closet rod. Mm -hmm. Oh. With, it has a pole, you pull it down, and it comes down to about this level so that I'm able to reach the clothing. I understand they now have one that's electric, which I'm going to wow. pursue next. That sounds neat. I'd like to have one in my room. <laughs> <laughs> And are you undergoing any treatments at this time? No, there really are no treatments no. other than the exercises and physical therapy and staying active and uh, ibuprofen. Uh, not much can be done at this point. So you, I, you, I know you're an artist. Yes. And how do you do that? Well, when one door clo closes, you open a window mm -hmm. and you always find another opportunity. I was an avid golfer. And since I can no longer do that very well, I decided to find something else that I was able to do, and I've taken up painting about six or seven years ago. Love every minute of it. I'm a pastelist. But the problem with that, again, is that my right hand becoming so weak that I'm unable to even curl it like this to hold it up to an easel, I have now taught myself how to paint left-handed. Oh, <laughs> Many times you can see me painting with both. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> and is, is muscular dystrophy an ever non-genetic? It's a good question. They're finding more and more variations, mm -hmm. and they have now discovered that there are what they call sporadic cases where they cannot find the lineage for it. Now, either it's because there was a milkman that nobody's <laughs> acknowledging, but in most of the cases, it, they're finding that they are the first ones in the line. Mm -hmm. And I know several people who are considered sporadic, but once they now have the genetic defect, they are equally inheritance ratio from that point forward of 50 percent to their children, one I out of two. See. I see. And it must affect relationships all over the place. All over the place, yes. Tell and me it about that. very much depends, again, on the severity, where you are in place and time, your own coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. and the strength of your family, your mates, your spouse, your children, 
your support group. And there are cases where it has pulled the family closer together, but there are many, many cases that I know of where the family unfortunately has separated because one or the other was unable to cope. Now, you grew up having it with your father. In my family. How did that affect your family structure? Very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, I didn't have any symptoms, so I was one of the able children having a disabled parent. Uh -huh. So I have that point of view as well. I see. And uh, my mother was Florence Nightingale, a 110-pound little woman who would have to drag my dad around. He would fall quite a bit. We as children were taught how to help him get up. We had ramps and little half steps throughout the house mm -hmm. and, and railings. And it made for a very difficult family with everything revolving around my dad. Mm -hmm. So it's a 50-50 proposition. And did you elect to have children or not? Uh, that's a very personal decision. Mm -hmm. I personally have chosen not to have children. Mm -hmm. uh, there are religious and ethical decisions that people have to go through and make. Because it is a 50% passing ratio and because my dad was so severe, I did not want to pass it on and I chose not to have children. I see. Well, that's a good choice for you, yes. right? And you know? I want to add to that, though. Today, they do have certain in vitro uh, testing that they can do before implantation. Mm -hmm. And it's oh. still experimental, they're still in clinical trials, but it is something they're looking at in order to allow people to have children without the worry of passing on the disease. It's a good thing today. <laughs> All the advances are terrific, you know? Um, and let's talk about research. What kind of research is going on? Very exciting. I, I, it's, I, my hair stands up on my arms because <laughs> for the first time ever, and this disease was first diagnosed in the 1800s mm -hmm. by two Frenchmen called Landuzi de Gerine, the two Frenchmen. And for the first time ever in the last several years, maybe two to three years, mm -hmm. they have found the molecular, biomolecular cause of the disease being three, maybe even four genes in complicit mischief giving instruction to the uh, DNA to replicate a toxin mm. that is destroying the muscle. It's layman terms, but it's more or less what's happening. Right, and something recently has been discovered. Yeah, right? in fact, they ha were able to create a mouse with FSH-like symptoms, and with a vaccine, they were able to interfere. They ha have a target, and they were able to interfere with this uh, uh, RNA, DNA instruction and reverse the symptoms on the mouse. Oh. It's very exciting. I'm so happy for that mouse. There is hope, <laughs> right? <laughs> Good things will happen to the mouse. Now, you're in the FSH Society. Yes. Tell me how that was created. I'm a dedicated volunteer. Um, I have decided that my motto is we can no longer sit and cope. We must get active and hope. And the FSA Society began in 1991 mm -hmm. by a mother and a son who were both very severely affected. The son is still the CEO. Mm -hmm. Carol, unfortunately, passed away this year from respiratory complications from FSA. Mm. Uh, it is one of the largest grassroots organizations in the country mm -hmm. of its kind, and it deals worldwide in research and funding to find a cure or treatment for FSA muscular dystrophy. That's fantastic. And you're involved in the fundraising, right? Yeah, there was not much going on in Southern California, mm -hmm. and I decided I wanted to wake us up as a sleeping giant, and I am the chair, I have a co-chair in Calabasas, mm -hmm. and together we are uh, having an annual fundraiser, a celebrity charity walk and roll mm -hmm. for FSA muscular dystrophy that we hold in Irvine annually. First year we raised 13,000 and had about 80 people, wow. but the second year we had over 300, and raised it close to 30000 and this year it looks like it's going to beat that. That's fantastic. Who were some of the celebrities that you had at your first one? Interesting. Max Adler, he's going to again be our celebrity host this year. Mm -hmm. uh, his mother and grandmother both had FSH, muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. He played the quintessential bully on Glee oh, right. for, for many years mm -hmm. and has now gone off to other movies as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a special guest, Brian uh, Goodell, mm -hmm. Caitlin Sandano, and Pat McCormick, who are Olympic gold medalists in swimming, who will again be a repeat uh, special guest this year, mm -hmm. and many other guests as well who come and support us and help us bring in uh, audience and funds. 
And what else is going on there? Are there th uh, things for children? Quite a bit mm -hmm. going on. It's a, a real event. We have games and prizes and music mm -hmm. and food that's being sponsored by Dave and Buster's every year. Oh, that's nice. And uh, it's, a, it's a real fun event. So what is your role in the, in the fundraising? I mean, what in your volunteering? Is it strictly fundraising? Uh, pretty much so, but I'm also a volunteer mm -hmm. uh, coordinator in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And when someone is looking to either volunteer or connect with somebody in this area who has FSH, they've been forwarding them to me and we've been connecting and uh, they're very, very happy to meet a live person with a disease that they have never seen before. Right. Now my experience with muscular dystrophy has always been the Jerry Lewis telethon and that's the only way. I had never heard about FSH. Tell us why there's a difference. As with many diseases, there w where there may be a major uh, fundraising foundation, uh, but that fundraising foundation may be an umbrella and has many, many other uh, fundraising groups as well. And they are involved with not only the nine muscular dystrophies, but a total of 43 other neuromuscular diseases, including ALS and the like. Right. So with ha having said that, nationwide, and they do a very, very good job, and they raise a lot of money, they have a lot of different needs that they have to work with. Mm -hmm. And each individual disease wants their own specific fundraising money going for their cause. So most of us, many of us, like ALS, like Duchenne's, have created their own specific augmented fundraising group. I see. And uh, although they do a good job, we want to make sure we're spoken for. What other types of volunteering opportunities are there at the FSH Society? Well, there are many fundraisers going on across the country. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, there are groups, whatever you can think of, whatever you, there's a, actually a tax day party. There is a group in New York who has concerts going on. Mm -hmm. So this is going on across the country and it's our way of bringing in the money because the FSH Society, which is lean and mean and only has three full-time employees, mm -hmm. Uh, is dedicated solely for research, and that's where the money goes. I've often gotten mixed up the, the terminology, muscular dystrophy and multiple sclerosis. I knew what you were going to say. <laughs> you knew that, right? <laughs> yeah. And is that pretty prevalent among Unfortunately, people? Unfortunately, and we have a standing joke about that, and mm -hmm. no one really knows why they get the two confused other mm -hmm. than once they both start with M. M. <laughs> one is muscular dystrophy and one is multiple sclerosis, right. but they're entirely different diseases. Uh, muscular dystrophy is a muscle wasting disease when multiple sclerosis is on the nerve end of it and just a totally different mechanism causing it. I see. And you mentioned that you do a lot of painting now. Do you go outside and paint, and how difficult is that? Uh, I'd, I'd love to go out and do plein mm -hmm. air painting. It is really too difficult for me to get to the beautiful sceneries and climb the cliffs and do mm -hmm. the walking. Uh, so I've been tr doing it via photograph. If I see something that I like, I will photograph it and do it in the studio. I see. That's really nice. And what other activities do you do besides the painting? and? Well, I still get out there and do a little bit of golf more as exercise than anything. Mm -hmm. Just even lifting the clubs in and out of the bag, walking up to the green, is, is, is a full day's exercise for me. Uh, so I, that, that keeps me going. Do you belong to any kind of group that you, where you get together and talk about your, your, yourselves? And as far as muscular dystrophy? Yes. There, there is a chat group online. Uh, which has oh. been actually created because of the FSA Society, mm -hmm. where we go on. It's through uh, Facebook, and it's a private group mm -hmm. so that others can't really see what you're saying unless they are invited oh, in. Okay. And quite a lot of personal information is give and take, and we do speak to people worldwide. Mm -hmm. That helps, knowing there's somebody out there that Very has much. the same thing. Very know, much. Really, really nice. Um, and I hope that our program helps educate because I certainly didn't know any of this and um, you know it, it's good to have this on the air it helps people understand um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the next celebrity walkathon and uh, it's usually held in what month usually held in October mm -hmm. uh, every year is how we're working it at this point and uh, if people want to know more information about it and more information about the FSH Society they can go to www.fshsociety.org right. forward slash Irvine Walk. Okay, and they can 
find out about volunteering also, yes. right? Yes. And uh, do you get in touch with them yourself? Or? If it's in this local area, they mm -hmm. will forward that to me. And yes, we then connect and see what we can do with each other. Amy, you mentioned to me that you were diagnosed in your late 20s? Yes. Okay. Now, what type of career, or, or were you in school, or what were you doing at that time? Well, originally I went to school to be a teacher, but when I graduated, and this was in New York, as you can tell from my <laughs> accent, which never leaves, uh, there was a surplus of teaching. And knowing I had FSH muscular dystrophy, uh, I had to think long and hard about what career I would want to choose that I could stick with mm -hmm. and be able to make a living and not have to abort as I physically got weaker. And how weak I would get was an unknown. Right. Uh, so I chose to go into insurance and became an insurance agent, mainly because I couldn't, knew I couldn't take the rigors of the trains and Manhattan and the stairs. So being an insurance agent, you are your own boss as far as your timing is concerned and when you travel and where you go. And that was one of the, the major decisions for me in my career choice. I see. And how did your, your MD uh, affect you during your career? I mean, it became very difficult to go upstairs. And I was one of these mom and pop insurance agents who did a lot of uh, over the table, kitchen table business and loved to be face to face as we are right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you have to start climbing stairs, and especially in New York, with, with the winters and the black ice and the cold and wearing heavy coats, mm -hmm. which I could, I was like a straitjacket, I wasn't even able to turn the wheel of the car. So my second major choice in my life was from my family and myself to relocate to San Diego, beautiful paradise San Diego, where um, there was no ice. Oh, <laughs> that's fabulous. And then what did you do? Did you, at that time, did you go into another career? Uh, no, actually, at that time, I was um, on disability. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, less and less golf, and now oh. using art as my avocation. I see. So that's, that's, and what about, like, words of encouragement to others? Well, first of all, I know, I remember that you said you wrote an article. Yeah. I, so tell me about that. I wrote an article, and it was meant as encouragement. Uh, I still have the article, which I do send out to newspapers from time to time, and it's titled, A Blessing Wrapped Inside of a Challenge. <gasps> That's great. Because it forces you to rethink yourself, to reinvent yourself. And going back to words of encouragement, uh, you have to constantly be reinventing yourself as the disease progresses, and you have to be adaptive. Uh, you must have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You must be your own advocate because many of the doctors are still just beginning to become aware of the disease. And you must be very stubborn. And you must educate yourself constantly. Yes. Right? Yes. Those are wonderful words. I like that. And you're just keeping yourself busy in every way. And I'm enjoying myself tremendously. Yeah. I'm involved with the Rancho Bernard Art Association, oh, okay. as well as being the chair of the fundraiser. Right. And uh, have good friends and just enjoying life. And that's the way to do it. Can you travel? Traveling now is becoming easier as uh, planes and trains are becoming more uh, uh, handicap accessible. Mm -hmm. But it's still a big effort. Is it? And uh, myself personally, I don't have a wanderlust anymore, but um, I am, we are, I'm in fact going, traveling to a, an FSH patient conference for the FSH Society okay. uh, next month. And then from there, we're visiting family. So this is going to be a good experience. And uh, the airlines told me not to worry. They will have, we prearrange for wheelchairs wherever needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a new world out there for us being able to get around. I know that being on a plane must be hard because I, I myself have no problem, but the, my knees are like almost in my mouth. So it's tough. Yeah, but the, and uh, again, depending on how severe you are, you can mm -hmm. make pre-arrangements, uh, whether you need an aisle seat, whether you need a special bulkhead seat, and mm -hmm. the airlines have become very accommodating, although traveling for everyone is very stressful today. It is, it is, and you know, just, just the idea of going to mm -hmm. travel mm -hmm. it stresses me out, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. I, I can imagine what you're going mm -hmm. through. And they do have a wheelchair right away for you, so you don't have to take a wheelchair? We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> We've arranged for it, and right. we'll, this is the first test for me, but I've, I've heard from many others who have the disease or quite more, more severe than I, mm -hmm. wheelchair bound only, who have traveled and found uh, accessibility to be far improved. Um, it's. 
for those who like to travel and have the, the ability to, to want to get out there, uh, it's available for them. I see. Does the FSH Society get involved in politics at all? Are you trying to change things? The only politics that they are involved in is Tan Perez, who I had mentioned earlier, who is the, the uh, president of the FSH Society, is very involved in testifying before Congress, trying to get more NIH money I see. released for muscular dystrophy and specifically for FSH as I say, now being acknowledged as the most prevalent um, worldwide. worldwide. Yeah. And worldwide, the FSA Society is working with, in collaboration with many research labs around the world, including in the Netherlands, Germany, mm -hmm. Italy. This is where the most recent research has emanated from. I see. As well as the United States and South America. This has been wonderful, Amy. I'm so glad that you came to visit us and enlightened me as well as our audience, I'm sure, you know. And thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. And if anyone out there is interested in more information about FSH muscular dystrophy and also the upcoming fundraiser in Irvine, California, please go to the FSH Society website, www.fshsociety.org slash Irvine Walk. If you'd like to find out more about joining our group here at Pace TV, please go to our website, www.pace-tv.com. It is never too late to have fun learning a new skill. Thanks for tuning in.